ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠಿ ಸೂತ್ರ ಅಸ್ಯಾಗ್ರಜಾಮುರಿಪುರಿ ಮಾಚೂರಿ ಗೋಷ್ಟಿ ರಾಕುಂದಗಿರಿವರ ಓ ರಾಧಿಕಾಸ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷ ಪ್ರತಿತ ಕೃಪೆಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರು ತಂ ನೋಸ್ಮಿ ಗೌರವೈ ಗೌರಚಂದ್ರ ರಾಧಿಕಾಯಿತೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಕ್ತ ತಕ್ತ ನಮೋ ನಮ ಆನಂದಲೀಲಮಾಯ ವಿಗ್ರಹಾಯ ಹೇಮ ದಿವ್ಯಶ್ಚಾಭಿಸುಂದರ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಮಹಾಪ್ರೇಮರಸಪ್ರದ ಚೈತನ್ಯಚಂದ್ರ ನಮೋ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಚೈತನ್ಯಚಂದ್ರ ನಮೋ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಚೈತನ್ಯಚಂದ್ರ ನಮೋ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಶಾಂ ಸುಂದರ್ ಶಿಖಂಡಶೇಖರ್ ಸ್ಮರಹ ಸುಮುರಳಿ ಮನೋಹರ ರಾಧಿಕರಸ ಕಮ್ಮ ಕೃಪ ನಿಧೆ ಸುಪ್ರಿಯ ಚಾರಣ ಕೇಂ ಕುರಿಂ ಕುರು ತವೈವಸ್ಮಿ ತವೈವಸ್ಮಿ ನಾಜಿವಾಮಿ ತ್ವಯಾಭಿ ವಿಖ್ಯಾಯ ದೇವಿ ತಂ ನಮಂ ಚಾಂತಿಕ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಓ I offer my Sastang Dhanavat Puspanjali, my heart like flowers thousands and thousands of times, at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Gurudev, Asmadiya Paramaradyatama Guru Pada Padma, Nitya Leela Pravishta Om Vishnu Pada, Ashtotara Sutasi Rupa Nuga Acharya Bariya, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Guru Dev, my Guru's Guru, to Srila Prabhupada and all of our great spiritual masters going back in an unbroken chain thousands of years to see Krishna himself. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Vanchakalpaturu Vyascha Kripas and Vevata Putitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Nama. So you may remember that last week uh, we began to discuss the f- the chapter 10 of Bhagavad Gita in the first verse and second verse see Krishna is explaining that again I will speak to you the greatest secret the king of all secrets in another way mm, which is a description of bhakti which is uh includes a description of my opulences and the reason for this is that if a person will hear such a description with devotion that will cause the divine beautiful swarup of sri krishna to appear in his heart and his devotion will be uh, nourished strengthened fortified by hearing such a description this is the in a meaning or confidential meaning of sri krishna's words he's not expressing it directly because it's krishna's nature to speak indirectly through parokshavad because the indirect explanation is full of rasa and also because it's krishna's nature that he likes to hide himself and even though he hides himself from his devotees due to the power of bhakti the power of love his devotees always find him that means if krishna hides himself the devotees will always catch him and if krishna tries to hide the meaning of what he wants to express by speaking prokshavad the devotees will be able to catch his confidential meaning and the meaning will remain hidden though it has been spoken by sri krishna it will remain hidden from the non devotees now we're coming to a wonderful third verse of bhagavad gita so krishna has some astonishing surprises for us all today let's see what krishna 
is saying to Arjuna, we're reporting live now from the battlefield of Kurukshetra. See, Krishna said to Arjuna, Yo ma madjam manadincha viti loka maheshwaram asamuddha samurteshu sarva papai pramuchati Yo ma madjam manadincha viti loka maheshwaram One who knows that I am, one who knows me, Krishna is saying, that I am Ajam, unborn, Anadi, without beginning, that I am Loka Maheshwaram, I am the supreme controller of all the worlds, then Asumudhasa Martyeshu Sarva Papai Vimuchate. Then that person, he is only the only one who is Asamuddha, not in a state of bewilderment. In other words, those who don't recognize the personal form, human-like, yet transcendental, divine origin of all existence, see Krishna's Swarup. Those who don't recognize that form as being the unborn, beginningless controller of all existence, those persons are bewildered. But one who does recognize, then that person is not bewildered, and he is Sarva Papai Pramuchite, he is liberated from all pap, all sins, the reactions of past lives activities, mm. the reactions of all the actions which were performed in a state of oblivious to obliviousness to God. The pap here means the the sins the impressions in the consciousness which were caused by any type of non-devotional activity. So, let's examine why Sri Krishna is saying this verse by looking at the context of the previous verse. In the previous verse, Sri Krishna has said, the devatas, the demigods, the great rishis, the great sages do not know about my extraordinary powers, my prabhav. They don't understand the confidential nature of my prabhav, that is my appearance, pastime in this world. And the reason they don't know is because I myself, I am the source of the great devatas and I am the source of the great rishis. Mm -hmm. So in the previous verse, see Krishna has spoken about those who cannot know him, those who don't know him, so we can connect the previous verse uh, with the conjunction. However, but, and then this w verse comes, but who can know me? And Krishna's giving a description of those persons now in this verse. Who can know me? He who knows that I am Ajam, unborn, that I am Anadi, without beginning, that I am Loka Maheshwaram, the controller, the lord of all the worlds, of all the planets, then that person is Asamudha, he is unbewildered, and he is the Sarva Papai Pramuchite, he becomes freed from all sins. Now, let's go into the profound implications of Sri Krishna's words. We have just uh, had a brief look at the translation, if you like, the direct meaning. But now, what are the implications of Krishna's words? Krishna is saying, there are thousands of people who try to know God. But, only those persons who are fortunate enough, who are made fortunate by the mercy of my devotees, to have the association of my devotees. They can know me. Why? Because they can learn from those devotees about my tattwa, who I am, and they can learn from those devotees about the path of bhakti by which I become uh, revealed. Only those who are fortunate enough to associate with my pure devotees can come to know about me because my pure devotees are the only ones who actually know me 
and no everyone else is guessing everyone else their knowledge is uh, incorrect or limited so now those who come to know about me by associating with my devotees they become free from sins and these sins are the obstacles stopping them from realizing me you see if a person his consciousness is filled with the impressions of rajas and tamas sinful activities then their chitta their mind stuff is not luminous enough it is not clear enough to catch the reflection of Sri Krishna's beauty at the time of their hearing chanting and meditating so in this sense the sins are an obstacle mm. not only that but if a person is free from sin but the pap beach that means the impressions in the heart from past sins for example you may have given up all sinful activities but impressions are still there in the heart of past sins which form the seeds of desire that can appear at any time uh, today or tomorrow in the future to inspire one to again perform some um, adharmic irreligious material act if those seeds are still there then the person though they may have some preliminary realization of the form of Krishna but they cannot experience his sweetness their consciousness is not clear enough to accommodate the uh, wonderful experience of the Madhurya the sweetness of Sri Krishna and therefore uh, in this verse Sri Krishna is saying by associating with my devotees hearing from them serving them one's sins become eradicated the seeds of sins the subtle subconscious impressions in the heart are eradicated one becomes free from bewilderment and he can know me in truth so now let's look at some of the adjectives that Sri Krishna uses to describe himself and he uses to describe the realizations about himself that the devotees have so the first one here yo mum ajam one who knows me ajam as unborn so here by saying the word ajam unborn see krishna is saying that i am different from any material product because all the products of this world they are all inert they are um, insentient they are jarred mm. so they are unconscious and ajam means I am not only different from all the material objects of the world but I am also different from any class of living being in this world whether they are human beings or animals or d angels demigods and so on I am not in that class either why because all of these objects and all of these beings they are they are uh, sajja they have birth but Krishna said I am Ajja I am unborn now see Krishna is saying that all the living beings in this world they have bodies and because these bodies are material they're subject to transformation and subject to death and then again sub the, the soul takes another body and he becomes ja, he becomes born so I am not among any such category of living being and now he wants to strengthen this point by saying yo mum ajam anadim I am anadi the word adi means beginning or origin Krishna said I am anadi I have no beginning and, and that can be connected with Ajam that I am unborn to say I, w I am unborn from time with no beginning also so by this see Krishna is n not only saying I'm different from every material product I'm not only different from every being born in this world but I'm also different from every liberated soul you see because a liberated soul 
uh, is also has now become Ajja. They have no more birth. They're free from birth. But their freedom from birth is not an Adi without a beginning. In other words, they were conditioned before. Then when they became Siddha, they became perfect. When they became Mukta Purush, when they became liberated, they became Ajja now without birth. But their Ajja, hmm, the, their quality of being without birth is not an Adi. It had a beginning. When they became liberated, then they became Ajja. But Krishna is saying, I am not like the great liberated souls either. I am Yomam Ajam Anadim Cha. I am not born and my quality of not being born also has no beginning. So then one may say that, well, perhaps he's like the liberated souls who are not, who haven't become liberated, but those who are Nitya Siddha. So in order to eradicate this um, proposal, now Krishna is saying in the next line, Veti Loka Maheshwaram. You should know me that I am the Lord of all the Lokas. That means of all the people and all the planets, all the universes. Being the controller of all the universes, I am the creator of all the universes, the maintainer and the destroyer of all the universes. So, in this way, now see Krishna is distinguishing himself from the eternally liberated souls. Now, eternally liberated souls do have creative powers. And uh, they do have the power to manifest many forms. They can even manifest planets. And th they have tremendous creative powers. However, they cannot create universes. And that's what Sri Krishna is saying here. And that's confirmed in the Vedanta Sutra. In Vedanta Sutra, in the fourth chapter, and uh, 4417, there, there's a very famous sutra, Jagad Vyapara Varjam, which means that even the liberated souls and eternally liberated souls, though they have creative powers similar to those of God, except they cannot create universes. And so Jagad Vapara Varjam, uh, this activity, this Vyapar of Jagat, Jagat creating the universes is Varjam, is, um, that is rejected, that is uh, not a possibility among even the liberated or the eternally liberated souls. So, um, if it were a fact that liberated souls could create the universe, then the second sutra of Vedanta and the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam also, uh, which uh, express Janmadhyasyayataha, the supreme truth is that from which all the universes have emanated. The supreme truth is, is the cause of the creation, maintenance and destruction of the universe. Then these sutras would not be uh, correct. And so on the basis of Shastra, it's to be understood that only Supreme Lord can create universes, even great liberated souls cannot do that. And so here we see in three words of this third verse of Bhagavad Gita, Ajam, Anadim and Loka Maheshwaram, see Krishna is expressing his uniqueness and how he is distinct from material objects the beings, conditioned souls of this world, liberated souls who are liberated from this world and eternally liberated souls. Now, see Krishna is also using the word anadi, beginningless, uh, as an uh, adjective to Maheshwara. So we've discussed how anadi is relevant to the word Aja in the first line. So you have Ajam, then you have Anadim, and you have Ajam Anadim. So now we're going to look how the the word Anadim connects with the word Maheshwaram. And that indicates that uh, the control of all the universes of the Supreme Lord itself also has no beginning, and that distinguishes him from great demigods 
and such as the guna avatars like Brahma and Shiva. Brahma and Shiva, you know, Lord Shiva is, is often called Mahesh. And here Krishna is also calling himself Mahesh, Maheshwaram. Mahesh, Maheshwaram means same thing. The control of the world. So Bra Shiva is known as Mahesh as well. Uh, but see, Krishna is saying here that uh, my Maheshwarata, my uh, supreme control over all the worlds has no uh, beginning. Now, what is the meaning of Asamuddha? A muddha means bewildered. Naive. Oblivious to something. Being in a state of dullness. Muddha. So some muddha means completely bewildered, completely na naive and completely dull. And asamuddha means that those who know me as the Supreme Lord of all without beginning being unborn, they are asamuddha, they are free from all uh, dullness and naivety and uh, ignorance of the truth. Yeah. So why is Krishna using this world? Hmm. So, Samudha, bewilderment, means that thinking that the knowledge of something else is knowledge of me. The devotee is devoid of that, that bewilderment. For example, someone may think, how can Krishna be unborn? Because everyone knows that Krishna's name is Yashoda Nandan, the son of Yashoda. Or, uh, most people think that though he's famous as Yashoda Nandan, he's not actually born from Yashoda, he was born from Devaki, so he's Devaki Nandan. So how is it possible that the person who is Devaki Nandan, the son of Devaki, can be Aja? So if a person thinks in this way, then that person is Samudha, bewildered. Why? Because the sign that a person is free from sin, the sign that a person is um, by the power of the mercy of Krishna's pure devotees and by the power of bhakti that they are becoming liberated from this world is that they can accept, their heart can accommodate this fact that Krishna can have the leela, perform the pastime of being born from the womb of Madhya Shoda while at the same time not giving up his quality of being Ajja, unborn. That by his Achincha Shakti, his inconceivable potency, he can be born and unborn simultaneously. So as long as the heart is affected by the pap sins, then one cannot accommodate this divine transcendental conception of the Supreme Lord who is always existing and playing with, uh, by the power of his Achincha Shakti, inconceivable potencies that can reconcile all contradictory characteristics and allow contradictory characteristics to uh, coincide, uh, to, to abide together. So Krishna's uh, quality is called the Viruddha Dharma, that see Krishna is the abode of all mutually contradictory characteristics. So now, Srila Vishnu Chakritako has said, someone may raise the question, and that is, do the great demigods and the Maharshis, the great Rishis, know the facts about the birth of your transcendental body, which itself is Parabrahman. Parabrahma, the supreme reality, and is itself beyond all the boundaries of time and space. Then see Krishna 
in reply to this question, he's touching his own chest with his forefinger and speaking this verse, Yo mam ajam anadim cha. Mam, beiti. He's saying that he who knows me alone to be the unborn truth, uh, then only that person can know the facts. So the implication is that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how qualified you are in terms of a, a designation in this world. You may be the highest demigod, you may be the highest sage, you may be the greatest learned scholar, or you may be a very simple illiterate person. But the only person who is not mm, uh, samudha, bewildered, is that person who knows me, Krishna is saying, as an unborn and uh, beginningless uh, controller of all the worlds. Only that person can know the truth. So, In Bhagavad Gita chapter 4, Sri Krishna said, Janma karma chame dibhyam evam yo veti tatotha chakta deham puna janma neti ma meti sojana. Hey Arjun, one who knows in truth that my birth and my activities are divya divine, then that person, he will come to me. So one meaning is when he gives up his body he will come to me and another meaning is oh not when he gives up his body but as soon as he knows he will come to me. So here to know in Tattva means to realize that see Krishna's form, his qualities, his associates, his birth and all his past all these together comprise Tattva. Tattva, the absolute truth. So one who realizes this comes to Krishna at once. He doesn't have to wait uh, to um, give up his his life. So, and in verse f chapter four, verse six, Krishna said, "Adjopi san avyayatma bhutanam mishropisam prakritim swama distaya sambhavami atma mayaya." Although I am Aja, unborn, and my transcendental body never undergoes deterioration or transformation, and I am Loka Meshwaram, I am the controller of all the world. So you see uh, some repetition here about Krishna's being Loka Meshwaram, the controller of all the worlds. He said, uh, I am. I, d I don't appear in a material body, but Prakritim Swama Dishtaya. I am always situated in my yoga, maya potency, in my own divine spiritual form, interacting with my own spiritual energies. Even when Krishna comes to this world, he does not interact with maya, he interacts only with yoga maya, his own spiritual potency. When it appears that he's interacting with persons in the mode of passion and ignorance, still, the passionate ignorance which is controlling them has, during the Leela, come under the control. It has become the shadow of Sri Krishna's Yoga Maya potency. So even all of their activities are being controlled by Krishna's internal energy, though they themselves are still cognitively experiencing the modes of passion and ignorance. So these are some of the, the nuances or the mysteries behind Krishna's karma, if you like, his Leela. Janma karma chame divyam. So Krishna is saying, you have, to, you have to know these secrets about my pastimes, that they're all transcendental, even when it appears that I'm interacting with mundane people in this world. Yeah. So one who knows these things comes to me, Sri Krishna says. Now, in these two verses of chapter 4, Sri Krishna is in one verse saying, Ajopi sanave atma, I am unborn. And in another verse, Janma kama chame divyam, I am born. So, this is the nature of Krishna that all these apparent opposites are reconciled. Now, Uddhav has 
spoken on this subject. This, what is our subject today? Essentially, Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita here that it doesn't matter how qualified you are, you cannot know me. But if you have the association of my devotees and, and follow them and perform bhakti, then you come to realize me. You come to realize things that those who are not on the path of bhakti could never imagine because their minds are working in terms of binary opposites, exclusive, exclusive thoughts, uh, the, uh, the, the logic of the, the law of the excluded middle, that either you're all-pervading or you're localized. But something cannot be localized and all-pervading, so that, that's the law of the excluded middle in logic. You cannot be, you're born or you're unborn, but you cannot be born and unborn. The middle is excluded in logic. So, uh, you cannot be the uh, unchanging absolute truth and yet have a distinction between parts of your body. You cannot be beyond duality and also have a right hand, left hand, eyes, nose, ears, which are all different from each other. So, things are either one or they're different. Things cannot be one and different. <laughs> so always by uh, thinking in terms of the law of the excluded middle, all the conditioned souls never ever come close to understanding anything about God. And only those who come to the path of devotee, devotion by the association of my devotees come to know these things and come to uh, realize these things. And not only that, but Krishna's sweet pastimes are full of even greater contradictions. For example, we know that Krishna is the absolute truth, but in his sweet pastimes, due to the power of the love of his devotees, he'll speak something and then break his word. Like he said, he would not take up a, a weapon on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, but because of the love of, of his love for Arjun, and secondarily, because of his love of Bhishma Dev, he took up a wheel. Um, he's the absolute truth. But when Mother Yasoda said, open your mouth to let me see if you've been eating dirt, he said, Naham Bakshitabam Amba. Hmm? I have not eaten dirt. So, uh, due to uh, being afraid of his mother, like a natural t child, he told a lie. So, he's the absolute truth, but he tells lies. So, when, though metaphysically, in God, there are many uh, mutually contradictory characteristics are reconciled. But in the sweet aspect of God, then the intensity of those coexisting contradictions becomes more and more intense, such that even great liberated devotees who are situated in Aishwarya Gyan find it very, very difficult to understand the love of the bridge basis and Krishna's behavior in Vrindavan. Hmm? My Guru Dev uh, once said, he said, Hanuman, he's always ready to protect Lord Ram. Hmm? But, and if he came to Vrindavan and he saw the way that the coward boys can throw him on the ground and jump on top of him and defeat him in wrestling, then Hanuman would become angry and try to run to his defense. So that's why Hanuman, he has to stay in Ayodhya and cannot stay in Vrindavan. Because even those who have realized God, even and they have devotion, when it comes to the, the profound mysteries of the sweetness of Krishna of Vrindavan, where those contradictions become even more condensed, even great devotees can also become bewildered. So, um, Srila Vishnu Chakritaka was giving an example from the third canto, of Srimad Bhagavatam, and it's a very wonderful verse. He's saying, this is third canto, chapter 4, verse 16. And he's illustrating uh, with practical examples what Sri Krishna is expressing in this, the third verse of Bhagavad Gita. He's saying, Kamanya ni hasya bavo bavasyate, durgastro tari bayat pralayanam, kalatmano yat pramadai yatasra maha, satmandrate kidyati di vidam miha. Bah. <laughs> He's saying, O Prabhu, 
even though you are desireless. You are anihas, aniha, anihasya. Of you who have no desire, but karma nyanihasya. Yo. You still perform karma. In other words, those who have no desires, they become renounced from this world and they don't do any karma. And those who have desires, they do karma in this world. But Krishna has no desires, but still when he comes into this world, we see, what is he doing? He's doing his duties as a Kattriya, doing karma in, in uh, Mathura and Dwarka. He's getting married and so on. Um, and we see in Brindavan, his karma or his dharma as a coward boy is to take the cows to graze in the fields during the day. And he's doing all of these things. So why is he doing this? If he has, if he has no desire, then he should be a sannyasi. So Krishna, he has no worldly desire, but he still engages in karma. What is this? So then he's saying, mm -hmm. although you are in bhavo abhavasyate, that means even though you are unborn, but still you are born. You take birth from the womb of Madhya Shoda. Mm -hmm. Then he's saying, even though you are Kalatmano, that means you are the controller of eternal time. Krishna said, we'll say later in Bhagavad Gita, Kalos me, I am time. And here Kalos also means time, also means death. Time is that which brings everyone to death. So though God himself is the controller of death personified, yet at the same time, then what did he do? Hmm? Durgasraya Tari Bayat Palayanam hmm? That means he fled away from his enemies. His enemies were coming. And out of fear he ran away and Durga Asrayo, he took shelter of a fort in the ocean. So this is referring to see Krishna, his being, uh, when he was in Mathura, Mathura was attacked by the demon Jarasandha 17 times. And then on the 18th time, not only Jarasandha, but before Jarasandha could attack, then uh, Kala Yavan was attacking Mathura with uh, 33 million barbarian Malacha Yavana soldiers. And uh, so what did Krishna do? He moved his, the whole Yadu dynasty. They vacated the city of Mathura and Krishna re-established them in a, a city fortress uh, surrounded by water on all sides and that is uh, Dwarka. So then he's saying Pramadayu Tashramaha Swat Swatmanrate Kidyati It means Oh Krishna not only that but even though you are Atmaram you are self satisfied you don't need anything other than yourself to experience pleasure but still what did you do? You enjoy amorous pastimes with sixteen thousand queens you married 16,000 princesses and enjoy amorous pastimes with them in Dwarka. So therefore, seeing these wonderful activities, then it is said, Kidyati di vidam miha. Seeing your activities in this world, vidam, even the learned persons, then Kidyati di, their di, their intelligence becomes bewildered, becomes disturbed. What is he doing? <laughs> So, this is a very beautiful verse in which uh, Udavji is making this point how Krishna's Leela is full of contradictions and due to these contradictions the common people are bewildered. No, not only the common people but even the devotees who are in the Aishwarya they have some Aishwarya Gyan. They cannot understand. Even we ha we're seeing pastimes here. They're not Kevala Madhurya. They're not pastimes of exclusive sweetness of Braja. But they're pastimes of the um, 
Madhurya Mishrit Aishwarya, opulence mixed with sweetness. Those are the pastimes of, of Dwarka. So, let's go into this a little bit more deeply. Uddhavi is saying, you, O Krishna, you are the controller of time that brings death to everyone. So, there is nothing more fearful than death. But Krishna himself is running away from uh, Mathura, running away from the battlefield. Krishna is famous as Ranchur, the, the one who, the, oh, that's a terrible insult. A, a Katriya, a warrior who flees from the battlefield is called a Ranchur. And so that's a, a most a shameful appellation. What is the history behind this? So perhaps you know that when Sri Krishna came to Mathura on the invitation of Kamsa Maharaj, Krishna uh, killed Kamsa uh, after wrestling with the wrestlers Chanura and Mustika. He killed Kamsa. And then after that, the two daughters, sorry, the two wives of Kamsa Maharaj, Asti and Prapti, they became widows and they were very, very upset. And uh, so in Srimad Bhagavatam, this history has been told how they went to their father. They, they didn't stay in Mathura, but rather they returned to uh, their father, who was Jarasandha, to complain about what had happened. And this is why Jarasandha decided to invade Mathura. And uh, we know Jarasandha attacked many times and Kalyavan attacked many times and, and Sri Krishna relocated the bridge, ba the, the residents of Mathura in Dwarka. Now, we, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the followers of Srila Rupa Goswami, our interest is in Brajalila. Our sambandha, our relationship with Krishna is with Krishna of Vrindavan and with the bridge basis. Mm -hmm. So, at the same time, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Srimad Bhagavatam, Pramana Mamalam. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the best evidence. And Srimad Bhagavatam, Yad Vaishtavanam Priyam, is very, very dear to the devotees. And yet we find in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, there are only 39 chapters dedicated to Krishna's Vrindavan Leela in the 10th canto. Uh, but the 10th canto was 90 chapters. So we have um, the 51 chapters dedicated to Sri Krishna's Mathura and Dwarka Lila. So why is this very Srimad Bhagavatam so dear to us when it puts more emphasis on pastimes outside of Vrindavan? And that is because the mood of love in separation is extremely uh, uh, valuable for Gaudiya Vaishnavas in their sadhana and even in the perfected stage separation is always there even at the time of meeting. So as in Gaudiya Vaishnavas, Rupanuga Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we want to always hear Harikata from the perspective of our own Sambandha, our own relationship with Krishna. So in what way do the Brajabasis consider these pastimes. So Srila Jiva Goswami Pada has explained that when Krishna was in Mathura, the Brajabasis are still in Braj, they're feeling separation from him. And of course they're always eager to find out news. So they were sending messengers back, back and forth to bring news. So one day, breathlessly a messenger arrived in Braj and came to Nanda Maharaj. Nanda Maharaj was surrounded by all the bridge buses and everyone was eager to hear. What's the news about our Krishna? What is he doing? They're so eager to get some news about him. So then the messenger said, Oh, you do you know what happened? After Krishna had killed Kamsa Maharaj and you returned, Nanda Maharaj returned from Mathura and went back to Braja. Then the, the two daughters of Jarasandha the widows of Kamsa Maharaj, they did not stay in Mathura. The bridge Basit says, why didn't they stay there? Is it because the residents of Mathura didn't trust them? Hmm? Is that why? 
Then the messenger said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what happened. They left Matura incognito in disguise. They kept their hair disheveled and their braids open over their breasts. Their clothes were old and torn and keeping a cloth like a hood over their heads on horses. They incognito secretly they left the city of Mathura and they rode to the capital city of their father Jarasandha and they approached Jarasandha like two forms of Chandi. So Chandi is the uh, ferocious, angry form of Durga. And they came to their father and they uh, presented uh, a great number of complaints. Oh, our father was, our husband was just curious. So he invited this uh, Krishna from Brandavan, who happens to be the son of Basudev and Devaki. He was hiding there. They invited him to come to Mathura and what did he do? As soon as he arrived, he killed our washerman. Can you imagine? Hmm? For no reason, he murdered our, our washerman who used to do the laundry and dye the cloth of our husband, Kamsa Maharaj. And then after that, he broke the uh, bow in the sacrificial arena. Then he's cruel to animals as well. He killed the elephant Kuvalayat Pida. And then he murdered all the great wrestling stars of the Mathura World Wrestling Association, hmm? Chanura and Mustika. And then he killed our husband Kamsa for no reason. He was innocent. Alas, alas. And when the, the Asti and Prapti were crying and expressing their anger in this way in front of their father, then Jarasandha became furious and he decided I will destroy Mathura, I will kill Krishna, I will destroy his whole dynasty, there will be no one left. <clears throat> so then, uh, when the bridge basses heard this, they are all afraid. Ah, what happened to our Krishna now? Is he safe? Is he safe? The messenger said, listen to what happened. <clears throat> Jarasandha assembled an army of 23 divisions that means 23 Okshahinis now just to give you some comparison the battle of Kurukshetra was a huge battle and there were 11 Okshahinis on the side of Duryodhan and there were 7 Okshahinis on the side of the Pandavas so all the warriors on both sides came to 18 Okshahinis now Jarasandha is attacking Mathura with 23 Okshahinis so that means 5 more divisions of soldiers than both of the sides on the battle of Kurukshetra combined. So it was a huge army and they surrounded uh, Mathura. And uh, at that time the ladies of Mathura they became very fearful. They went up onto the roofs of their palaces to see what was happening outside the city walls. So at that time Krishna he just smiled and he, when he smiled two chariots descended from the sky two golden chariots and one of the chariots was equipped with weapons such as chakra and a chariot driver named Daruka and there was a flag on the flag there was Garuda and on the other chariot there was a, a plow and a pestle uh, a grinding uh, pestle and so these are the divine weapons of Krishna and Balaram and, and Balaram's chariot had the a flag with the mark of the tal, the palm tree. So then she Krishna said to Balaram, Oh my dear brother, please alight your chariot and let's go and face these warriors. So when the messengers described how when the battle was about to begin, these two chariots with divine weapons descended from the sky and landed there. Then the bridge basses, when they heard this, they looked at each other and said, Aha! Just see! Lord Narayan's helping our Krishna. <laughs> We've seen it many times. Whenever there was a problem, whenever there was a danger in Vrindavan, then Lord Narayan would always come and help and Krishna would be safe. And why is that? Some bridge basis said yes. And it's because of the piety of our King Nanda Maharaj. Because Nanda Maharaj is always worshipping Lord Narayan. That's why Lord Narayan always helps his son Krishna. So, 
those who are hearing from the perspective of Aishwarya, then they'll see, oh yes, the divine eternal chariots with the weapons of Krishna and Balaram appeared there. Uh, and those who are hearing from the perspective of the bridge basses will see, oh just look, our king Nanda Maharaj, he's so pious that Narayan always comes to help his son when he's in danger. So this is a good lesson for everyone. Always hear, chant and remember with Sambandha Gyan from the perspective of your own specific relationship with Sri Krishna. So then Krishna and Balaram, they went outside of the city and there was a ferocious battle. And in that battle, Krishna and Balaram destroyed all the warriors. Everyone was killed in the army of Jarasandha. There was one survivor that was Jarasandha himself. And Balaram caught him and tied him up and brought him before Krishna. But Krishna decided to let him go. Why? Because he knew that Jarasandha would collect more warriors and attack again. And in this way, Jarasandha was becoming an instrument for the mission of Vishnu who was present within the form of Krishna of removing the burden of the earth in the form of the violent and demonic kings, uh, Katriyas of the world. So Krishna let him go. So then, the Jarasandha, he went to perform austerities to try to get some powers to defeat Krishna. But some of the other kings came to him and said, look, you're young and you're a Katriya, doing austerities is not appropriate for you. Don't worry. That all your soldiers got wiped out, that was just because it was just a bad astrological time for you. Hmm? Just like now, you know, retrograde Mercury is coming. We had an eclipse yesterday. There's another eclipse um, in, in two weeks time. And then there'll be another eclipse a after that as well. And uh, so it's, a, it, it's an inauspicious uh, astrological time in the world now. So try to be really humble. Don't get into any quarrels with anyone. Take shelter of the holy name and the mission of the spiritual master. Or I guarantee you will find yourself in the biggest trouble you've ever been in your whole life in the next few weeks. And you can see that the world is descending into complete chaos at the moment too. So anyway... The demonic kings, they, they told Jarasandha, look, it's just a bad astrological time for you. Otherwise, how could such an impossible thing happen that every one of your soldiers would be killed in a battle against such a smaller army? So you should get together another army and attack again. So be encouraged by Asat Sangha, uh, demonic association. Then Jarasandha decided to attack again. He gathered together another huge army and he attacked again and they were also destroyed. And he still didn't get the message. He did this 17 times. And every time his army was destroyed. On the 18th time, uh, when he was coming, he was coming with another army. But before he could arrive there, what happened? The huge demon, Kala Yavan, the leader of the barbarian soldiers, came with 33 million barbarians. And they were attacking Mathura bef just before Jarasandha and his 18th army were arriving. Now, in this particular verse, Uddhav is saying that Durgasrayo Thari Bayat Palayanam, that even though Krishna is um, the controller of death personified, of fear personified, yet he fled out of fear and established a, a city in the ocean Dwarka. There's a story behind this. So what happened is when Jarasandha kept attacking the first few times that he attacked then the messengers from Mathura came to Braj and informed on Nanda Maharaj the situation in Braj is very critical and Nanda Maharaj and all the bridge basses were so afraid for Krishna so they decided that they should do some yagyas. So then Nanda Maharaj, he got the local brahmanas of Braj like Baguri Rishi and Shandilya Rishi. And they were all day doing sacrifices, swaha, swaha, and praying for Krishna's protection. Praying to Lord Narayan for Sri Krishna's protection. Om Narayanaya, swaha, swaha. Day and night they were performing uh, yagyas. And after each yagya, then Nanda Maharaj was giving so much charity and cows to the brahmanas and to, to all the people and all the people of Vrindavan they were so worried and in their hearts they were praying I, Krishna is going to be 
and the Yadus, they are going to be destroyed. Being there in Mathura. We wish that Krishna could have some impenetrable fortress in the middle of the ocean where he would be safe. And only because all the bridge buses were doing yagyas and praying in this way, then because Sri Krishna is under the control of the love of his devotees, one day Krishna came to Ugrasain Maharaj and he said, I have an idea. Hmm? <laughs> Krishna has an idea. Where did this idea come from? Krishna is always in the heart of his devotees. And the devotees are in the heart of Krishna. Sadhvi Grastaridaya, oh Krishna said, My devotees have controlled my heart. So Krishna had an inspiration to relocate all the people of Mathura in uh, a fortress in the ocean. Why? Because of the prayers and the desires and the yagyas performed by Nanda Maharaj and the bridge passes. Hmm? So you should know that the all of Krishna's pastimes, however gruesome or militaristic or whatever they may seem, like this is a very mm, violent militaristic pastime, but at the foundation of all is nothing but Brajaprem, the love of the residents of Vrindavan. So, see, Krishna went to Ugrasen Maharaj and he proposed, uh, we should relocate everyone in the very far away. Ugra Sain Maharaj said, we are Katriyas, we cannot, we should not flee, hmm? we should stand and fight. But see Krishna, he called Vishwakarma and Vishwakarma came there and Krishna said, show him the plans. So then Vishwakarma showed the plan of the city of Dwarka to uh, Ugra Sain Maharaj and he sort of said, this is a tremendous, incredible place. Hmm? And how long will, they're, they're about to attack right now, how long will it take to construct this? Vishwakarma said, you don't worry about anything, I've already constructed it. <laughs> it's just hiding under the ocean, it will, it will come up out of the ocean. Just give us the, just give us the command. So in this way, uh, Dwarka was uh, manifest. And when the residents of uh, Mathura fell asleep that night, then the next morning they woke up in their beds in beautiful palaces uh, in the fortified metropolis of Dwarka, surrounded by water on all sides, and they were completely safe. So they wondered, how did that happen? How did it happen? That's impossible. So how did it happen? By Yoga Maya. So my Gurudev used to say, just as the residents of Mathura, one night they went to sleep and then they woke up and they found themselves in Dwarka, so in the same way, the, if you follow this path of devotion, you will not know what is death. It will be as if you just fell asleep and then you woke up and you're in Goloka Vrindavan. Hmm? Yoga Maya will manage all of these things. Don't worry about anything. So, then Kaliyavan, he came to attack the city and Krishna came out of the city but without a chariot, without any weapons. No weapons at all. And Kaliyavan saw him and those who are proud of their heroism don't want to win unfairly. So Kaliyavan put down all of his weapons and left his chariot and came running at Krishna to fight with him with his bare hands. And as he was approaching Krishna, Krishna said to him, he said, look, hmm, if you can touch me, then you win. And if you can't touch me, then I win. So Krishna, being a coward boy, just turned this world war into a game of tag. Mm -hmm. So then... <laughs> so then Krishna, having made this challenge, like as he, as he used to do in Vrindavan, if you touch me, you win. If you can't touch me, I win. So then Kaliyavan was running after him and Krishna was uh, casually strolling away from the battlefield. And this... Katriyas can't do this. That means you're a rancho, you're a coward. Um, it, it's this is a terrible ill fame. So, but Kaliyavan was running as fast as he could and he, was, he felt as if he were just about to touch Krishna. Uh, but he couldn't quite touch him. And Krishna led him very far away into a mountain and Krishna disappeared into a mountain cave. And as you know, King Muchikunda was sleeping there and Krishna took his pitambara, his yellow cloth, and put it over the sleeping king. So that when 
Carl Yavin came in, he thought, oh, what now? What's he doing? Now he's taking rest here. And he came up and kicked, thinking he was kicking Krishna. Then Carl Yavin woke up from his... Muchakunda, sorry. He woke up from his rest. And uh, then with the, it, the power of his yoga city that was given by the demigods, fire came from his eyes and he killed uh, Carl Yavin. So, uh, in this way, uh, see Krishna... Though he has no fear of anyone, but he has shown fear and ran away from the battlefield. And he has moved all the residents of Mathura to Dwarka. And so it's very difficult to understand why he did this. Why did he do this? So that's what we have been revealing today. Why did he do it? The answer is Prem. Because the answer why Krishna does everything is Prem. Those who don't have Prem cannot know him. This is the conclusion. So, Uddhav is saying, even though Krishna is self-satisfied, pramada yutashrama, the general meaning is that, that he has uh, married 16,108 queens, but here it just says, the pramada ayuta, thousands and thousands of uh, uh, young ladies who are intoxicated with their uh, youth and beauty. So uh, this can also refer to the gopis of Vrindavan, even though God is self-satisfied. Bhagavan apitaratri shad utfulla malika viksharanta manas chakre yoga mayam upasitaha Though Krishna is self-satisfied, but still he has a desire to dance in the Rasalila with the Braja gopis uh, because their praying has uh, completely covered his knowledge of his own Bhagavata. Mm -hmm. And because there is a joy in tasting praying which Krishna cannot experience within himself, he can only experience that by uh, loving pastimes with his devotees. And yet he's still Atmaram, self satisfied, because these gopis are his Atma. They are. His Swarup is made of Swarup Shakti and the Shakti of his Swarup has manifest outwardly. The Ananda, the joy of his own Swarup is manifest in the form of Radhika and all the gopis of Vrindavan. So even though he's enjoying with so many beautiful gopis, it does not uh, mitigate his, it does not compromise in any way his Atmaramata, his metaphysical self-satisfaction. So. Now we're coming to the point Asamudha. Asamudha mm, means that those who are free from sins, they are Asamudha, they are not bewildered. But there's another side to this, and that is that in Lagu Bhagavatam Rita, uh, Sila Rupa Goswami says that sometimes you see Narad Muni says, I am bewildered, and Brahma is bewildered, and Shiva is bewildered. These are all pure devotees. Their bewilderment we mentioned this last week, their bewilderment is not caused by the mode of ignorance and passion, but they are bewildered by Krishna's yoga maya. Um, and, and so even uh, those who are liberated, they become uh, confused seeing the sweetness of Krishna's pastimes. So an example is given in the first canto, chapter 8, Verse 31, Queen Kunti, she says, Gopyada de Twai Kritaga Siddhama Tavad, Yate de Shasu Kalinanjana Sam Brahmakshi, Vaktram Niniya by a Bavanaya, Stitasya, Sam Mam Vimohayati Be, Apiyad Bibeti. The meaning is, Oh my dear Krishna. Now, Krishna is about to leave Hastinapur to return to Dwarka. And Kunti Devi is approaching him and offering beautiful prayers from her heart. And she's saying, Oh my dear Krishna, Mother Yashoda took a rope to bind you because you had made the offense of breaking the yogurt pot. And when she took that rope to bind you, Oh Krishna, your eyes were filled with fear and you were breathing heavily and trembling. And the tears, your tears were washing away the black cudgel Madhya Shoda had put on your eyes. 
And when I see how you're afraid of your mother, this sight bewilders me. It's bewildering for me. So here's an example of how a person, even a great liberated eternal associate, who is not fully absorbed in the sweetness of Vrindavan, even becomes the moha, becomes in a state of bewilderment, but it's a transcendental bewilderment due to their awareness of Krishna's opulences. And what's causing that bewilderment? So we cannot say that Krishna is God and so he's not afraid of anyone. But in Vrindavan, in order to give happiness to his devotees, he pretends to be afraid of his mother to give her happiness. We cannot say this. Hmm? And this is exactly what Kunti Devi is saying here, that when in my heart I see your eyes, Krishna, as a baby, your eyes are actually filled with fear. And that fear is real. Hmm? If she were thinking, yes, I know that Krishna's God, but in Vrindavan he acts like a baby and pretends to be afraid, then there wouldn't be anything that's confusing. But the fact that the fear in Krishna's eyes is real, he's actually afraid. For those who are in Aishwarya Gyan, they have knowledge of Krishna, that is something that they cannot reconcile. So this is an example of the bewilderment even of the pure devotees outside of Braja. So, how can we reconcile this? We should know that avidya or ignorance is the function of maya, the external energy. Avidya vritti, we were discussing this last week. The ignorance potency of maya has two aspects, avarnatmaka and vikshepatmaka or prakshepatmaka. Srila Prabhupada used to say always Prakshep Atmika, Jiva Goswami is used with Vikshep Atmika. But it still has the same meaning, it means that which causes distraction. So one aspect of Maya covers our awareness of ourselves as spiritual beings, and the other aspect of Maya makes us become distracted by the activities of the material world, and we become absorbed in that, and as a consequence become subject to all kinds of fear and anxiety and stress and etc. Right? So if you're in fear, anxiety and stress, just remember you're in Maya. So, now, Maya is causing all types of distress by binding up the, li the, the living entities by, with, with uh, ignorance in this way. So, now, in the same way, it is the spiritual potency, not the external Maya, but the internal potency, Yoga Maya, especially Krishna's Leela Shakti. The Yoga Maya is Krishna's Leela Shakti, his pastime potency. And it is that Yoga Maya that covers the consciousness of Madhya Yashoda that even when Krishna manifests tremendous opulences, then she mm, does not uh, consider it at all. And similarly, the essence of the Chit Shakti, the spiritual potency, which is called Prane, that praying of Madhya Shoda covers Krishna's knowledge of himself. So it is the power of the love of Madhya Shoda that uh, causes her to not inquire into the manifestation of Krishna's opulence. That's the power of her praying. And the power of her praying also causes Krishna to lose any awareness of his own Bhagavata, of his own Godhood. So when he sees Madhya Shoda coming with that rope in her hand, Krishna is really afraid. Now one might say that if God can be covered by a type of Maya, then this is a defect in God. But this is only a projection based on our own experience of Maya. Why? Because when we in the material world are covered by ignorance, when we are bound, just like a prisoner is bound in chains, those chains become the cause of his misery. Hmm? So from his perspective, to be bound is a terrible thing and it's a fault. However, a wealthy person is bound up by a silk shirt, He's bound by gold and jeweled chains and necklaces. He's bound by a very expensive and colorful turban. So he's also bound. 
But that binding, unlike the shackles of the prisoner, actually causes him great happiness. So he would never consider being dressed so opulently as being a defect. He would think it was one of his attributes. So similarly, mm, uh, Krishna, he becomes happy being bound by the brain of his devotees. It gives him great pleasure and therefore Krishna's so-called ignorance or forgetfulness of his godhood is not a fault but it's an attribute whereby Krishna himself can experience unlimited times more happiness, more pleasure and deep relationships with his devotees than he can when he is sarvagya, when he's, uh, he's omniscient and when he is uh, relating to the devotees in Aishwarya, such as in his form of Narayan in Vaikuntha. So therefore it is said in the third canto, chapter 9, text 5, it is a very beautiful verse. Ye tu tvadiya charanam bujakosha gandam jigranti kana vivarai sutivata nitam bhaktyagrihita charana parayacha tesham naipasi natari dayamburyat sopumsa. The meaning is that, O oh my Lord, your devotees can smell the aroma of your lotus feet. How? Because the aroma of your beautiful lotus feet is carried in the air of Harikata. And that Vedic sound, that Shabda Brahma, enters through the holes of the ear of the devotee. And when it enters, then those devotees surrender to you fully and accept devotional service exclusively as the meaning of their life. And then, when their hearts are captivated by your fragrance and your beauty, and they're fully saturated with the spirit of devotion, O oh Krishna, you come and you live in the hearts of your devotees and you never leave them. Sajorit aviru de te atrakriti bi susru chanat. Krishna enters into the heart of the devotee through the medium of listening to his pastimes and the door shuts behind him and he can never get out. So, see, Krishna is bound by the ropes of love. He's realized by uh, the devotees. The devotees are never bewildered. Uh, and uh, their lives are completely perfect. This is what Sri Krishna is expressing here in this verse of Bhagavad Gita. So step by step we're slowly approaching uh, verse 4, 5, 6, 7 and then the Chatosloki Gita is coming very soon. I wanted to arrive at it two weeks ago but somehow or other mm, just each verse and each word of this Bhagavad Gita uh, began to distract me from reaching the Chatosloki Gita and alas alas here we are still on verse 3 after a few weeks uh, but never mind what can we do this uh, the important thing is that we become Avesh in a state of absorption that Avesh should be based on our Sambandha, our own particular relationship with Sri Krishna and nourished again and again so our eternal relationship and eternal services become clearer and clearer through following this path of Bhakti. Bali Vrindavan Vihai Lala Ki Jai Varasani Wali Ki Jai 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 Si Radhe Shamitai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Vohu